Oh, well, hi, everyone. Um, so two things have changed since that biog was written. I'm now a senior lecturer. Uh, and also, um, I have stopped being the program lead for the Fusion uh, Masters. Uh, I've been doing it for the last five years, and I've handed it over to the very capable hands of Professor Nigel Wolsey in the audience. So uh, he's, he's now uh, the guy in charge. And that's because I have a new citizenship role, which is to, I'm the chair of the uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the entire school we now sit in. As you can imagine, that's a rather big job. So no longer get to do. But anyway, uh, I'm eminently qualified to talk about this, uh, this topic. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Fusion CDT, the training program, because there'll be people in the audience that won't be familiar with that, and then move on to how uh, we interact with external facilities uh, external partners and what that means going forward uh, in terms of the landscape. Now, this is a rather busy slide to start with, but the bullet point here is that the biggest threat to fusion is people and trying to get well-trained people in to do the job, right? And not only that, because it's quite a diverse, as you can imagine, a diverse range of organisations, you need a diverse range of people for a number of reasons, right? There are obvious reasons for this, but also it's very important to have a diverse range of employees because of things like energy justice as well. Who is Fusion for? Fusion is for everyone. So we need to make sure that <coughs> equity and fairness is woven in right from the beginning. And the way that you do that is by having a diverse workforce. So, so there are many reasons to do this. Now, this picture is specifically looking at university interaction with all the partners that are interested in fusion in the UK and wider. Um, yes, there's a lot to look at, I understand here. But what, what this is meant to be highlighting is that there is a very broad range of things happening now in the UK. The landscape has changed massively in fusion globally, uh, and um, our workforce has to reflect that. And so training is key to, to try and help enable the work that's going on. Um, of course, there's other ways in other than via universities, and the universities are not at the top because it flows down. These are kind of multiple relationships in many different ways, okay? I don't want you to think that we think we sit at the top, you know, lording it over you. That's not it, right? We're, it's just the different kind of relationships that are reflected here. And of course, we have our lovely MSC Infusion Energy over in the corner, which feeds both into the university training programs and directly into fusion industry as well. So it's an important program uh, in the UK. So in terms of the scope of our CDT, we uh, cover two main areas. Particularly, we focus on the plasma physics side of things. That's where our expertise is in York, particularly, uh, and material science as well. And of course, as you can see, as we're moving into an era where we're actively talking about building and operating prototypes, things like STEP, things, what First Light Fusion are doing, and so forth, we are going to start building these things in and around people. And so we have to understand and consider what people think about this sort of thing and engage with people as well, which is why we need to start growing our social science expertise in these areas as well. We think it's really important, and hence why we've started to grow that aspect of our CDT as well. Um, this is in a number of different areas, particularly around regulation and licensing. Public acceptability was particularly pertinent for things like STEP, for example. It now has a site in West Burton, and so engagement with the, the local community is really important, uh, and also around fusion economics as well. So the CDT itself, it's not York, it's five universities, it's led by York, but it's a conglomeration of Durham, Liverpool, Manchester, Oxford, and York. Uh, there's been 40 academics involved, past and present, supervising projects over the years. At any given time, there are 70 or 80 students across all cohorts in our CDT, and we have five absolutely fantastic administrators that stop the whole thing from going on fire because, of, sure, as you would imagine, if it was just left to us, it almost certainly would. Uh, we collaborate with many different uh, external organisations. Obviously, UKA is an extremely important partner, AWE, Fusion for Energy, ETA, NNL, RAL. The list is not exhaustive here. This is just a few of them. And, of course, our relationships with industry uh, the ones we have and the ones we want to have are incredibly important 
uh, especially now that private fusion is a thing and it is coming uh, and it is in the UK currently. And also the wider supply chain is incredibly important, how to facilitate and understand our relationships with the, with the supply chain itself. Um, I might be just speaking for myself, but I think there are many academics in the room that feel that no matter how good our research is, the most impactful thing we do is train the next generation. It's certainly the thing that brings me the most joy in my career, and I think it's true to say that it's one of the most impactful things you can do as an academic. And indeed, in any institutional organization, is training the next generation. And so we hope to train this next generation of, of students to exploit ITER, of course. That's a, a massive, great machine over, over the sea. Um, and exploit international laser facilities as well, such as the NIF, the wonderful work that's been going on there. Of course, they're going to be the ones that design, build, and then operate STEP as well. We want them to support private fusion companies such as First Light Fusion, Tokamak Energy, to drive the faster delivery of fusion energy, because I think we can all agree that would be excellent if we could get there a bit faster. Um, also to develop and, and help support the, the fusion supply chain, which is happening, and also contribute to industries in adjacent sectors such as fission, for example, which we have a very close relationship with. So just to give you a sense of the kind of, uh, A, where the funding comes from, and B, the kind of topics that we end up doing. So about a third of the money for our CDT comes from EPSRC studentships, and then the other two thirds come from a combination of university studentship leverage and our partners, so our external partners uh, as well, uh, including Private Fusion. Um, and it goes across a number of different disciplines from inertial confinement fusion, magnetic confinement fusion, material science, control and instrumentation, which tends to cut across all those areas. And then, of course, our little burgeoning wedge uh, in the social sciences as well, which we are developing. So it's a, there is distinct advantages to the cohort training program because not only are they raised by us, they're raised by each other as well, and they get a much broader perspective of what they're doing. I remember when I did my PhD, I was sitting in a tiny little office with a postdoc at RAL, and that was it. It was just me. And so even though I was at Imperial, I was massively disconnected to some extent from what was happening, unless I actually showed up at the door and went, hello. So th this cohort training kind of style is meant to kind of get away from that kind of lumpy experience and to kind of make people have a broader sense of what's going on in the world of fusion so that when they come to apply themselves in their research project, which is the thing that is dominating their training <coughs> in these programs, then they have a much broader perspective of what's going on. So that's kind of enabled in the early times by um, group introductory modules and kind of uh, cohesive training across the different strands. Uh, so that's uh, what we call... Uh, the broadening type stuff, okay? Um, and that also does extend out to our social science strand as well in various different ways. And then, of course, there's specific training over six months, either in the material strand, the plasma strand, and then the social science strand have their own training programs as well. And underpinning all of that is things around responsible research and innovation, is, which is really important as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaboratory later, but that's one thing that they do sort of part way through their, um, through their program, but I'm going to come back to that. We have an annual Frontiers um, and Interfaces of Fusion conference, which is student-led, but uh, invites experts from all around the world to talk about the, the cutting-edge stuff that's going on in fusion at the time. We all love attending it as well. It's a complete buzz uh, to hear what's going on. Uh, and then the students have their own conference, which we're not involved in academics, it's just them talking about their own research and swapping ideas and that's so important for, for the kind of training that they're receiving. And then we have a completely vibrant outreach programme which I'm also very involved in and um, it's optional but people really like to get involved because you can do anything from podcasting all the way through to standing up and uh, talking in front of people. So in terms of our relationships with external organisations, there's a number of different ways in which we engage with uh, external folks. 
Um, firstly, through careers and networking, we often have alum come back from uh, whatever that is they're doing in the world, because it's very hard to imagine, what do you do on a daily basis? I can't picture myself in that role. They come back, we have panels, they discuss. We also have multiple CDT events, which, of course, industry partners are a very firm part of in terms of um, the particular topic that we've chosen to hang it on. For example, one time we did small nuclear, so we had a lot of chat around SMRs, for example, Rolls-Royce were there. Um, also, the alumni indulge in uh, optional mentoring of our students, again, to help our students kind of decide what it is they want to end up doing at the end, or rather what they don't want to do as well, which is an equally valid viewpoint. Um, our external partners fund PhDs, either in part or in full, uh, in, the, uh, in the CDT. As I said before, we have this Frontiers and um, Fusion Technology sort of short fat courses as part of the training programme, which are delivered by external experts. Uh, particularly international experts as well, and that's a really important part of how our external partners can get involved. Of course, we do experiments on facilities, a whole broad range of facilities, and so we really get involved and collaborate with our external partners in that way. And again, similarly with computational facilities, we can't always maintain and support those things within our universities, so we need the bigger things like Arch2 and so forth in order to support our computational work. And then we have these collaboratories, which I'm going to talk about, and also uh, a new thing that we have uh, started to run called the Fusion Industry School, which I'm going to... I have a whole slide on that later, so I'll tell you about that in a bit. Oh, and of course, one blob I didn't add here is we have industry and external partners in our external advisory board, and they help us advise our, our programme at large at the kind of strategic level. That's really important. First lighter on our board, for example. So in terms of actually activities at facilities, uh, we carry our research out in a huge range of facilities, both in the UK and overseas. Um, these are just some of the examples. This is not an exhaustive list at all, but this kind of shows you the breadth of, you know, from trad ICF and I MCF kind of programs all the way through to the nuclear AMRC and much more sort of engineering focused type work. And we also have students from our program based at both UKAA and, and STFC specifically in the CLF, because that's really important. They maybe do their research, uh, their, um, their learning for six months at York, but then go out into the world and are based in those facilities. And that really works for them, but it also really works for us because it helps maintain those relationships with facilities and you know, deepen those links. So everybody wins out of these kind of relationships, I think. Um, partway through the project, the students get to do what is called a collaboratory, which is kind of a mini research project in and of itself. It can be exactly on topic and therefore they can use it in their thesis, or it can be a complete body swerve, whichever they think is going to be the better learning experience. So students plan, they write a grant proposal, even down to things like risk analysis and kind of budget, etc., etc. It goes in, it almost invariably gets spat back again, they make the changes and then it goes in, and then they go off and do their three-month project. Um, and this is designed to kind of broaden the students' horizons and networks, but not only the students, the academics as well, because they may be working with people we've never worked with before, or deepening the relationship with people we do work with. For example, my first student went to, to work at PISA, who I have a relationship with, but it led to a much closer relationship with them, a Royal Society travel grant, and, uh, and um, yet another PhD down the line. My, the second student has almost finished. So it was a really, it's a really worthwhile activity, and lots can come out of that. And obviously, those projects are very, very um, strongly encouraged to be international, at international facilities, and our international partners. So uh, it's a good, valuable experience in that sense. So in terms of looking at how we work with First Light specifically, uh, we currently have two part funded studentships with First Light. So one in the field of laboratory astrophysics, that's with uh, Nigel Woolsey sitting in the audience there. Uh, that's partly using the gas gun stuff as well and uh, other laser experiments as well. And then Chris Murphy has uh, a student on advanced source development and that's specifically around x-rays and things like coded aperture work. Uh, we also have had three MSc projects with First Light Fusion, one of which was a, a wonderful student called Rosie Barker, who has ended up being an absolute star at First Light Fusion. I, I identified really early on that uh, she was going to be excellent, and now she's at First Light being excellent, I believe. So uh, uh, 
We miss her, but we're very glad she's with you now uh, doing her thing. And First Light Fusion are also members of our external advisory board and give us some extremely welcome advice with regards to the training programme and how it should look going forward into the future. Now, Howard and I, in the summer of uh, Howard Wilson, of course, Professor Howard Wilson, who's sitting at the back here, um, we were uh, approached uh, in the summer of 2021 uh, by several, independently, several big engineering firms wanting to upskill their staff in the area of fusion because they're, it's not part of their core business as it stands or is part of their core business, but they don't do much in that area. And so uh, because of this, we decided to run a fusion industry school to help companies kind of get uh, informed and upskilled in the area of fusion, kind of help develop the supply chain and their knowledge of fusion as well. Um, and this was in conjunction with UKAA. And so we had two different events, one in the June of 22, which was the more plasma resiliency focused one, and that was uh, at York. And then the more materials e technology one that was based in Oxford in September of 2022. Um, this gives you, this picture gives you a sense of the amount of people that attend. So it was it's a pretty decent number for a first go, actually. Uh, we want to grow it, obviously. Um, if you're interested in uh, finding out what happened, that's the, if these slides are ever distributed, I don't know, but anyway, you could, if you Google Fusion CDT, the page is linked from there anyway, right? Um, the one thing that we thought was really important is that any surplus funds that are raised by this conference go straight back into our equality, diversity, and inclusion work to help develop the workforce and make it as broad as possible uh, because we're doing a lot of work in that area and so that's a fantastic outcome we're going to run it again next year so let's uh, watch this space now i'm just hoving into the very last few slides it will not surprise you to learn that york indeed are intending to put another bid in uh, as a lead, as a lead partner um, that is all I can tell you at the point because we're still hammering out the details of what's going to happen, but it is happening, so I'm, guess you're, I'm guessing you're not going to be surprised about that. So what does that mean in terms of working with particularly First Light since it's their party? Yep, yeah, this is my last line. Um, so um, we're very keen on obviously developing any relationships with external partners. Um, because their involvement in our doctoral training provision is absolutely key. It adds a level of credibility and realism that I think you wouldn't have if you didn't have those kind of relationships and involvements. And of course, we're very, very keen to grow our relationship with First Light even further. Um, their facilities, specifically as well, Machine 4, will be very useful and interesting to us. Their skills, their expertise would certainly uplift and enhance our own training program. We think it would be a fantastic relationship to, to deepen further. There are many areas of overlap which we see, uh, specifically with our high energy density physics work. So in terms of theory and simulation, diagnostic development particularly for a lot of us, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a given. And also Lab Astro, which is also adjacent to inertial confinement fusion physics as well. And we think specifically, this is all about our students, and we think relationships with industry in our training program give them the best learning experience. It presents many opportunities for them to develop their industrial skills, their entrepreneurial skills, and enhance their employability, which is massively what we're about here. We want them to go out into the world and do good stuff, right? And so this is how we enable. So, in summary, as you, we can all see, the fusion landscape, both in the UK and globally, has changed massively in the last decade. The advent of private fusion has really changed that. There's an, amuse, there's a, an emerging fusion, fusion supply chain. And also, we've had some pretty major results, both in ICF and MCF this year. So all in all, it's been pretty optimistic one way or another. It's very exciting. And so we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the critical element here is we now have to ensure, with all these lovely projects that we are dreaming up, that there's enough brilliant, well-trained and excellent people that can support this. Otherwise, we're just going to be nicking each other's stuff, right? We, we need more people uh, across a very large range of areas, right? And, uh, and ensuring that that workforce is diverse for the reasons that I've set out. Obviously, fusion training is key to this and not just at the doctoral level. We want apprenticeships at all, you know, at all levels, not just the universities and uh, 
students going into to organisations that way. And we also, as well, then need to uh, support and enable the fusion supply chain as well. So on that note, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you so much for listening. I'm around for the rest of the day, so if you do want to chat about training programmes, that is totally fine. Uh, yeah, so I think um, any one of us here, if, if you know me or Nigel or Howard, just drop us a line, right? Um, Roddy, is, Roddy Van is the one leading the kind of getting together of the bid, but yes, please talk to any one of us uh, in order to um, find ways of uh, relating to us and, and being involved, for sure. <coughs> Are you finding that for each of your student places, there is lots of interest? What I'm trying to understand is, is there a problem that there is an interest in fusion? Or um, uh, are there just not enough places because each one is oversubscribed? So I'm, I can certainly say that we're, we're always oversubscribed in the CDT. Um, at the moment, I think... It, is, it can be difficult to recruit at certain times of the year. So, for example, if you're not in the main body, sort of as you get to the, the end of the year and then all the application deadlines are in the January, if you have PhD students starting after that period of time, then all the good students have kind of been hoovered up to a certain extent. So there is... I think at the PhD level, as it stands, there's probably not a supply issue yet, but there will be, clearly, because there's going to be a lot more opportunity. For... When I started running the, the masters, it was basically maybe half went into PhD programs, half went into the kind of wider diaspora. Now we have private fusion, and some of them go there, right? And so the, the sort of diversity of areas they can go means that it is a bit of a zero-sum game unless we have more people coming in and provide more routes in as well, not just through PhD programs. So I think that's... Important. Yeah. Okay, we are running a bit behind, so maybe we can take one more time. Ooh.